Thank you, Doug. Doug. It's, it's great, great to see, see all of you, and, and really, really a great, great pleasure to have, have the privilege of introducing you to Stephanie. Stephanie, uh, Stephanie, Stephanie and I sort of become, become acquainted through her role as chaplain, chaplain to the House of Bishops, Bishops. And, and so, so uh, we, we, we have, have this sort of acquaintance where we squeal and kiss when we see each other. But yeah. But uh, Stephanie, Stephanie is truly is one of the, the, the great gifted young leaders of the Episcopal Church, Church and you are in for a treat uh, this evening. Stephanie, Stephanie is now the uh, canon for missional vitality in the Diocese of Long Island, where she's been about a, just a few months. It's new news. But she is working with the 146 churches of that diocese on mission and ministry. And uh, the Diocese of Long Island is uh, Long Island, of course, but also Brooklyn and Queens. And Stephanie has written a couple of books, Radical Welcome and The Other and the Spirit of Transformation. And she, you may know her primarily in her role as the founding priest for the Crossing Community in Boston, which it, uh, is an emergent congregation based at the Cathedral of St. Paul in Boston. And um, as I said, she has been uh, having an amazing impact as chaplain to the House of Bishops and is just completing also a um, three-year term as co-chair for the Standing Commission on Mission and Evangelism for the Episcopal Church. She's a graduate of Harvard Divinity and Episcopal Divinity, and though she now calls Brooklyn home, very proud to tell you she's from a small town in Kentucky. So great to know about her. Her topic tonight is wonderful, has a wonderful title of Babies and Bathwater, Navigating the Death of Establishment and the Rebirth of a Missional Episcopal Church. I'm going to just read a little bit about the uh, sort of her thesis statement for this night, and I'm sure she'll be elaborating, but she, she puts it this way. Anglicanism, at its truest and best, stretches one arm to embrace ancient Catholic traditions and the other to embrace local contexts, thus holding to its founding impulse from one of the very early prayer books to keep the mean between the two extremes of too much stiffness in refusing and of too much easiness in admitting any variation from it. Wonderful quote. How, How shall we, we keep, keep these original, original commitments at a time of unprecedented change, mission context shifting overnight, the church of the establishment crumbling before our eyes? What kind of leadership, liturgical frameworks, and pastoral care do we need to foster to keep the Anglican baby but pour in much needed and fresh bathwater? So it's, so it's my, my great, great privilege, privilege to, to introduce to you Stephanie, Stephanie Spillard. Now I, am I on? All right. Um, so I want to thank everyone for the incredible just hospitality. It's been pouring forth since before I even got here. And um, what you don't know is that I was supposed to leave tomorrow afternoon, and I was already trying to figure out a way not to have to go, because it is 80 degrees here, and it is a blizzard in New York. And JetBlue already just decided that I'm staying. So <laughs> My flight was canceled about two hours ago. So, <laughs> so if anybody wants to go out for cupcakes and hey, cupcake, I am in. <laughs> As, as I've, I've already, already posted, posted on, on Facebook. Facebook. So, <laughs> um, so, so blessings, blessings again to you all. It is an honor and really a joy to be here right now with you. Um, it is also a bit intimidating to be speaking with you at a seminary. Um, I feel like I should begin here with some scholarly discourse. Um, but, um, but instead, there is an image that I have in my head, and I kind of can't get rid of it. It's an image that I'm thinking of as the miracle on Front Street. You see, St. George's Episcopal Church 
is one of the oldest in the Diocese of Long Island where I serve. They were established in 1702 by a royal charter. Now it is a West Indian parish. Surely those royals never expected that to happen. <laughs> And though you will see almost exclusively black people in this church, they are holding on to Anglo tradition so faithfully, I think the queen would be proud. But here's the miracle. I visited them just a few Sundays ago, and I learned that the young people of this congregation, trained as acolytes and Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, had just asked for a meeting with the rector. And they, and they told me when I went to the church, the young people kind of pulled me aside and said, Rav Steph, or now I guess it's Canon Steph. <laughs> we want to help to shape the worship of our church. So we've asked for a meeting with our rector. Because we don't just want to be a part of the show anymore. We want to bring our ideas. We want our friends to come to church. And right now, we can't bring them here. I am praising God right now for those young people. I feel like the future of our denomination as a living community that embodies and proclaims Jesus Christ depends on listening to these voices from the margins, reducing resistance to their wisdom, loosening the grip on a particular culture's interpretation of Anglicanism. I know the transformation can happen. I know, I know that it is happening. happening. If you have seen it, please say amen. amen. If you have dreamt of it, then say amen. Because <laughs> you know, as I do, that God still has a mission, and we are still God's church. And the new life is breaking in all over the place. You know, as I do, that the establishment church identity is making less and less sense for us. And that a missional church is coming to life. A church in new relationship with its neighbors and emerging cultures, not dominating, not assimilating, but listening, embracing, partnering, and engaging in transformation into the likeness, the fullness of Jesus Christ. So I celebrate that revolution right now. But even as I celebrate it, I know that we are still living through the birth pains and sitting with some serious questions. First among them is the question embedded in the title of this talk. How will we negotiate the end of establishment, the end of empire, and the birth of a missional way? And how can we avoid throwing out the baby with the bathwater? Because you know we can. We just have to explore how. So my title right now is I am the canon for missional vitality in the Diocese of Long Island, which means I get to stir mission and ministry with 146 Episcopal churches in Brooklyn, Queens, and all of Long Island. Now before that, I was blessed to serve for seven years as founding priest and lead organizer for The Crossing, which is a fresh expression of Anglican tradition based and born at the cathedral in Boston, St. Paul's. Before that, I served as the, the cathedral's minister for radical welcome. What all that means is that I spent a lot of time talking about change and, as I understand it, completely freaking out most of the Episcopalians around me. So that panic that I heard often gets expressed with this line, I would just hate to throw out the baby with the bathwater. You know, I used to get frustrated when people tossed out that line. It seemed, it seemed like they, like they were throwing, throwing up a block and trying, trying to stop, stop any change dead in its tracks. But then I began to ask, what's the wisdom in this caution? And what is the fear that it's masking? And what the heck is the baby? Because <laughs> you see, I don't want to throw the baby out. And I don't know many Episcopalians who do. We wouldn't be in this church if we didn't have regard for the baby, if we didn't find and love God manifest in the traditions and the essentials that have carried Anglican Christians closer to God for centuries. But words like throw, as in throwing out the baby or the water, those words imply some carelessness or even violence. 
on the part of those who usher in any change. Kind of like, oops, I wasn't really looking. I thought I was throwing out bathwater, and they're with the baby. <laughs> The phrase completely dismisses the wisdom of translation, adaptation, or really any variation from the original. But isn't our tradition all about living with attention? A tension. The preface of the 1662 Book of Common Prayer calls it the mean between the two extremes of too much stiffness and refusing or too much easiness in admitting any variation from it. More recently, Rowan Williams, who's the former, there's that piece, Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, worked to open up Anglican imagination on this topic, and he once wrote, if church is what happens when people encounter the risen Jesus and commit themselves to sustaining and deepening that encounter in their encounter with each other, well, then there's plenty of theological room for diversity of rhythm and style, so long as we have ways of identifying the same living Christ at the heart of every expression of Christian life in common. What that means is that spiky Anglo-Catholics, snake belly low church Protestants, and guitar strumming evangelicals, we're all together in this all figuring out how to share and embody the gospel of Jesus Christ in our context. And it's a delicate dance. You can rest assured we are not the first to trip our way through it. Paul actually spoke of it in his letter to Timothy. On the one hand, he told those early followers not to be ashamed of the gospel, but to go forth unfettered by the spirit of fear and to take up the spirit of power and love and self-discipline. But in the very next breath, he warns Timothy, hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me and the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. What is this teaching Paul speaks of? What is this treasure? What is the teaching and the treasure for us? I think we need to figure it out together, in our contexts, And we need to do it soon. Because here's the danger. If we are so scared that we never touch the baby or the bath water, if we just leave that baby to get pickled in tepid gray bath water, <laughs> that is not taking care of the baby, OK? <laughs> if you love that baby so much, give her some fresh water. Amen? All right. So if you'll sing our way, sing your way with me into this next piece, feel free to stand as you are able. If I've got to talk for this long, y'all are going to get up and down a lot. <laughs> well, somebody with a nice, strong voice, get us started. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, well, well, the Church of Christ in every age, beset by change, but spirit blood must claim in test its heritage and keep on rising from the dead. Then let the servant church of Christ, a caring church that longs to be, speed it up, a partner in Christ's sacrifice and clothed in Christ's humanity. We have no mission but to serve. In full obedience to our Lord, to care for all without reserve, and spread his liberating word. Lovely. Have a seat. <laughs> So it is this church, this baby, 
Well, I would suggest that the baby that we are trying to protect and nurture is the set of Anglican essentials that wherever or whatever change might come, those essentials will be recognizable components of our common life and tradition. I've posed this question to a number of Episcopal groups throughout our church. Here's what they tend to agree on. For starters, one essential principle is the vernacular principle. Now, the original impulse behind the formation of the Church of England was to create an indigenous church, one that worshipped in the cultural and spoken language of the people. The 1549 prayer book puts it in these fancy terms. <laughs> the particular forms of divine worship and the rites and ceremonies appointed to be used therein being things in their own nature indifferent and alterable, and so acknowledged. It is but reasonable that upon weighty and important considerations, according to the various exigency of times and occasions, such changes and alterations should be made therein, as to those that are in place of authority should from time to time seem either necessary or expedient. In declaring that the forms, why is that funny? <laughs> My brother's laughing. <laughs> it is wonderful. <laughs> In declaring that these forms of divine worship can and should be changed from time to time according to the local context, in keeping with the core of the faith, Thomas Cranmer laid the foundation for a church capable of moving from context to context without bending. With, wait, wait, bending, but not breaking. <laughs> That's kind of the whole point, isn't it? <laughs> Kwakwilan, professor at Episcopal Divinity School, leans on this very wisdom in her contribution to the book Beyond Colonial Anglicanism, the Anglican Communion in the 21st Century, where she writes, Anglicanism was a cultural hybrid from the beginning, and this tradition should be celebrated in our post-colonial world. As a cultural hybrid of Catholicism and Protestantism, the Church of England in the 16th century assimilated elements from both traditions to create a very fluid identity. And then Ian Douglas, who served as her co-editor for the same volume, laid out a similar vision when he wrote, and I'll lead into this, the advent of the Church of England marked a reconception of the body of Christ on the English shores that was at once profoundly particular and profoundly Catholic. This process of contextualization in which the Church becomes grounded in the local realities of a particular people while remaining in communion across differences of culture and geography this is where Anglican identity lies. And then he nails it when he says, Anglicanism thus can be understood as the embrace and celebration of apostolic Catholicity within vernacular moments. Would you read that sentence with me again? <laughs> All together now. Anglicanism thus can be understood as the embrace and celebration of apostolic Catholicity within vernacular moments. Now that he's a bishop, I don't know how he talks to people. <laughs> but but I, I know that what he's saying here is that when we are truest to our roots, Anglican Christians honor and celebrate the Catholic, universal, comprehensive, sacramental, apostolic traditions passed from the earliest days of Christianity up through the councils and creeds, through theological development and engagement happening on the ground today. But that affirmation happens, it has to happen in vernacular moments, the particular contextual moments in place and time that are our reality. Douglas Ian goes on to say that this is where God in Jesus meets believers again and again, in all our uniqueness of culture, and, and contextual specificity 
In other words, this context is where the gospel is translated and becomes the lively and true word of God among God's people. The Anglican way, then, is pure hybrid, plain and simple. It is also rooted in ancient Catholic traditions, another essential for us. You know, I grew up in the South, surrounded by Baptists, who would split over the pastor's new car or the music director's salary. I think you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I also grew up a child of a single mom, and I grew up squarely in the middle of Generation X, in the advent of latchkey kids and MTV. I am convinced that God led me to this Episcopal tradition because I needed some stability and discipline. I am an Episcopalian, at least in part, because I long to walk in that ancient stream, to bathe in it, to know myself to be connected to my own ancestors, and yours too. Life today has enough fragmentation and chaos. Hello? Hello. Especially in Brooklyn. <laughs> I want, I need words that have stood the test of time. I want walls coated with the prayers of the faithful so that I don't even have to utter a word to feel that I have joined a never ceasing wave of prayer held by the communion of saints. I need sacraments that communicate holiness, not just into my brain, but into my body shifting the locus of my life so that I am no longer my own, but I finally enter union with God. Those Catholic traditions, ancient, disciplined, practical, mystical, sacramental, are essential. They are core to the Anglican way of following and embodying Jesus Christ. There are some other essentials. Incarnation. We are, after all, the original incarnational Christians. So we trust that all people are made in God's image, that Jesus took on humanity and graced all of creation with the divine life. We know this broken world continues to reveal God's glory. So we seek and we serve Christ in the creation and in the people around us. There's also, of course, the via media. We are forever reconciling one opposite to another. Now that doesn't make us mushy. What it does is make us honest. It makes us real. And frankly, it equips us to live faithfully in a complex and real world. The Via Media. Now some folks would say that the Book of Common Prayer is essential. We'll get back to that. <laughs> For now, I would suggest to you that what is essential is not a particular text, but rather the shape of the liturgical ordo, or I would say the rhythm of the ritual. Moving to that rhythm, we can flex and we can embrace others, even as the pattern and the rhythm remains like a good beat that we can all dance to. There's also, of course, the episcopacy. If we're going to be called Episcopal, then I guess we need some bishops. <laughs> These are the leaders we ask to represent our relationship with one another and with the church as it has traveled through ages. They are men and women called, equipped, and consecrated for a particular role as apostles, prophets, and teachers among us. Are you realistic enough to know, I think, that you can get a lot of stuff done when you can organize people around a visionary pastoral leader who catalyzes ministries and speaks with authority to the powers of this world. It's good to have bishops. It's also good to have a mission. What else is essential? God's mission. Reconciling the world to God in Christ. That's our mission. And we take it up by embodying his life within the bodies that are our churches. We take up that mission by proclaiming his gospel with word and action. And we take it up by bearing his healing, transformative spirit into the world. 
So the resurrection breaks out all over the place. And of course, most essential of all is the love and the reality of God in Jesus Christ. Somebody please say amen. <laughs> I knew you were waiting for it, weren't you? <laughs> I'm not going to forget Jesus. <laughs> in Ephesians, what we hear is that in Christ, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Jesus is the cornerstone, not our cultural preferences, not our cultural mores, but Jesus. Anything that grows us into his likeness, shapes us into his body, serves his reign, is to be celebrated. Anything that obscures his good news, obscures the world's vision of Christ alive, well, then we need to approach those things afresh. So this is the baby. If there are any Episcopalians crouched in a defensive posture, ready to fend off potential change out of fear for this baby, I think they can relax. Because just look at it. This is a distinctive church. If we are living true to this identity, holding on to these essentials, there's more than enough that will mark us as Anglican and more than enough to ground a compelling witness to the good news of Jesus Christ. We can venture beyond a particular liturgical cultural box. The baby will be there. We can take some risks for the sake of the gospel, because the baby will be there. We can create some gracious space, embrace another group's culture, and welcome them to weave what they have in with the received tradition because this baby ain't going anywhere. Amen. If you'll stand as you are able. I won't assume that you know this song, but it's a really simple and lovely one, and I hope that it guides us into this next session. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you, keep it going, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, let the harmonies ring, I want to see you, one more time. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Now, if you'll close your eyes and sing. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. I want to see you. Have a seat. So the baby. That extraordinary Anglican baby will be there. But what's the tepid bath water the baby has been sitting in low these many years? <laughs> well, partly, it's empire and establishment. If there is a force preventing our embrace of emerging contexts and cultures, preventing our full engagement with the mission of God, this is it. Now, there's a word for this phenomenon, not the aristocracy or aristocrats, but episcocrats. Say that one with me. Say it again. <laughs> the term is coined, as far as I can deduce, in 1978 by Kit and Frederica, I'm going to mess up the last name, Connellidge, we're going to call them. Um, two, um, two journalists who wrote the social, the social history, history, the power of their, their glory, America's, America's ruling, ruling class, the Episcopalians. 
I finally got my hands on this book just last week and devoured it. I'd heard a lot about it over the years. It's the first time I held it. I took this picture on the altar of our cathedral in Long Island. <laughs> it seemed at home there. <laughs> so it's hard for us to imagine, but for these two authors, the Episcopal Church is not so much a religion as an institution that hosts and nurtures the cultural markers and mores of America's ruling class. It's also the institution that inducts select outsiders into upper-class ways. They point out, for instance, that as of 1976, one-third of corporate wealth in America was controlled by Episcopalians. At the same time, the church was statistically the wealthiest, most Eastern, best educated, and most highly placed professionally of any religious group in the country. After they finished with those numbers, they pulled the case together and cinched it tight. When they wrote, even these characteristics, even these characteristics, noticeably higher income, education, and status levels than those of most all other denominations, even these characteristics do not make Episcopalians the uniquely influential group they have been in America. They go on, Episcopalians are outstandingly powerful because they have bred a small, super successful, and super wealthy elite that has become historically and today America's aristocracy. These are the people we have called the Episcopats. What has made them so important to the country is that their set of attitudes and mores, fertilized by a distinctly Anglophiliac and Episcopal atmosphere of feeling, has been adopted by non-Episcopalians as the standard for upper-class conduct in law, government, and business. The influence of this distinctly Episcopal, of, it, of the distinctly Episcopalian institutions, the prep schools, the colleges, the metropolitan clubs, can hardly be overstated. Maybe they were right then. Surely things have changed now, right? In 1976, 48% of Episcopalians made more than $20,000 a year compared to only 21% of Americans. In 2009, 35% of Episcopalians made more than $100,000 a year, the highest proportion of wealthy people in any religious group in America, compared to 18% of Americans who make that much. In 1976, 45% of Episcopalians had gone to college, compared with 29% of Americans. 2009, 57% of Episcopalians had finished college or graduate school, and only 27% of Americans had attained those levels of education. We have long been the church of the slaveholders, the industrialists, the owning and managing class. What I would submit to you is that those mores, that anglophiliac, formal, classy posture, is a part of our DNA today. It even travels across race and region and class. I stand before you as, as an example the working-class girl from Kentucky who went to Harvard. This is the bathwater the baby has been sitting in for a long, long time. What's in this water? Take a deep breath. <laughs> Often in groups, I... I'll actually, actually just kind of hit the pause, pause button, button right now. Actually, actually, I have not presented these figures, figures before, but when I'm presenting something like this, I hit the pause and, and say, do you have any questions? <laughs> How are you feeling right now? <laughs> um, we're going to keep plowing through. Into empire and establishment. One of the components, one of the elements swimming in that water. Empire is a touchy word in America. We were once colonized, but then we threw off the colonial yoke and became the United States of America. 
We were once the Church of England, but then we adapted the prayer book, vested more power in the hands of the laity, imbued the whole structure with the glow of the American democratic spirit. We became the Protestant Episcopal Church, and that should have been enough, but it wasn't. Because you see, we were supposed to be a full vernacular expression of Catholic tradition in this context. But as the English extended their domination over the globe, missionaries accompanied colonizers, and the spread of the church merged with and reinforced the expansion of empire. Even when English rulers left America, the revolutionaries and founders very quickly became the institution builders. And funny, the Episcopal Church was the natural container for the culture, values, aesthetic, and theology of a new Anglo-American elite. And so the Episcopats were born. Today, the prominence of a defined ruling class, that's faded somewhat. And so has our dream of holding forth as the national established church of the United States of America. And yet, especially when it comes to liturgy and culture, Anglicans overwhelmingly still resonate with upper-class elite values of order, perfection, and sober bearing. You see it in the way we look down just a bit at other churches. Isn't it unfortunate how noisy and unreasonable those Baptist and Pentecostals are? <laughs> and the Catholics, well, they're just so ethnic. <laughs> For Episcopalians, perfection, order, and tact are next to godliness. Now, I serve in a largely Anglo-Catholic diocese, and I know that our penchant for perfection and formal formality can be seen as a sign of humility and respect toward the awesome and almighty one that we worship. But just as often, that shift begins to turn us into the frozen chosen. And we balk in the face of the diverse cultural expressions emerging all around us. So you can love that tradition and that aesthetic, but please don't be mistaken. What we call Episcopal looks, acts, and quacks a lot like upper-class refinement. This is the backwater. There's also, of course, the prayer book, specifically worship limited to the prayer book. Now, our church is home to many ideologies, many theologies. We are early adopters on advancement in many quarters around gender, human sexuality, even sometimes race. And the and conventional, conventional wisdom, wisdom is that we can bear all of that because the prayer book holds us together. Amen? The same book that holds us together also ropes us off. There are too many cultures and generations who don't pray as we do, whose heart song doesn't sound like anything in that 82 hymnal. <laughs> Although they, they might, might otherwise love to be a part of this unique body of Christ. So, so something's got to give. Because here's, here's the truth, y'all. Worship, worship reflects what we value the most. most. I'll say it again. Worship, worship reflects what we value most. It is our foretaste of the heavenly banquet, the embodiment of Christian community and eschatological hope. It communicates what is most beautiful and, by omission, what is not. What is worthy of God and by its absence, what is not. How often have you been in a group of Episcopalians and heard that tisk tisk about another denomination's worship? Well, I went to that church, but it was much too loud. All that prayer with no form, I couldn't stand it. <laughs> and how often has your music minister informed you, oh, I don't play that? <laughs> We often say it almost respectfully, 
Like, like if, if we, we can't, can't do it well, well it's best, best that we just not try. try. But underneath, there is always a choice. And I would submit to you also a judgment. We will accommodate all manner of change in this church with grace and humor. But we can be downright arrogant and even mean-spirited when something violates our good liturgical taste. The trouble is that the cultural expressions our church has defined as tacky are overwhelmingly lined with groups of lower social class, non-dominant racial orientation, or younger generations. And so our attachment to certain cultural expressions is not just about a preference, an aesthetic preference. It actually creates a wall, or more accurate still, a hierarchy, with Episcopal tradition being the most evolved expression of Christianity on the earth to date. The word for what we end up with is segregation. It is a sad reality for us and, unfortunately, for most of our Protestant brothers and sisters in the main line. No, I am not so naive or flowery that I think one congregation or even one denomination can be everything to everyone. And I know that nobody wants bland mush for church. But surely there's something between the mush and segregation. Surely there's something between mush and the spiritual suffocation that we exist in, in this bathwater. I keep hearing Paul telling the Ephesians that Christ himself is our peace. He has made the two one and destroyed every barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Why aren't we outraged at that dividing wall? Why do we defend that dividing wall. There, there must be a way toward reconciliation. Even though your culture is not mine, and your music is not mine, and your leadership style is not mine, can I love you enough to find some wisdom and beauty in what you bring? And in time, can my love for you open my heart? And maybe I will begin to love what you love. And we could finally welcome each other, not just for coffee and not just for a service project, but for mutual transformation into the fullness of Christ. But we can dream. Stand as you're able. Hmm. Wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water, God's gonna trouble the water, why don't you wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait. God's gonna trouble the water. See that host all dressed in white. God's gonna trouble the water. Well, the looks like the band of the Israelites. God's gonna trouble the water. Come on and wait in the water. Wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. If you don't think I've been redeemed, God's gonna trouble the waters. Just follow me down to the Jordan stream. God's gonna trouble the water. You can clap. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's
God's gonna trouble the water. God's gonna trouble. God's gonna trouble the water. God's gonna trouble. God's gonna trouble the waters. Have a seat. Clearly, it's going to take some change in order to realize that dream of mutual transformation in Christ, that dream of reconciliation, that dream of seeing that dividing wall crumble. It's going to take some fresh water. And by fresh water for the baby, I'm not talking about removing one dominant culture and then inserting another one. I'm talking about a whole other way of being. Beyond establishment and domination, and toward becoming missional. Now, by missional, I am echoing the work of Dwight Shiley, Lutheran seminary professor and Episcopal priest, who speaks of a church that is discovering and joining God's mission in the neighborhood. That's missional. Now, there's a vibrant missional church conversation going on all over the place right now, and it dovetails perfectly with the emergent church church conversation conversation also going on in many quarters, which which I would would submit to you actually rises from the work of liberation liberation theology theology, way before the emergence ever came onto the scene, way way before anybody was talking about mission. All of these movements share a common commitment to contextual mission, shaped around three related movements. And there's work that we've been doing in Long Island, and we've created this diagram to sort of explain some of what is this missional church that's being born. These are the movements of a missional church. We go out into our neighborhoods, and we are listening to our neighbors, to their pain, their longings, their gifts, their concerns. Then we are embracing and transforming the communities around us because of what we've heard, even as our communities begin to embrace and transform the churches. It's mutual. All of which leads into partnering with these neighbors and emerging cultures so that together we can all join God's mission and love the world into wholeness. In every age, we have had missional leaders who did this. Missionaries who flipped the script and embraced God in their contexts. They might have served in Asia or Africa. Now, we are the missionaries. And the mission field is the yoga studio across the street, or the bodega around the corner. Wherever you are, the guiding light is the same. So you'll read with me from Luke. Go on your way. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide. For the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. I wonder what you sense in this passage. I hear vulnerability. I hear a lack of mastery. I see empty hands that become healing hands. I see readiness to weave the gifts of our own tradition together with the gifts of the culture around us. This kind of vulnerability and receptivity is not something the Episcopal Church is known for. We rarely teach it in our seminaries. We rarely practice it in our church leadership or social ministries. But I can't stop thinking about those kids I told you about, the kids at St. George's, the historic church in Hempstead. Young people who made a brave offer to save their church, 
and not just to save it, but to get it ready for mission with their own generation. We could become a missional church. We could follow these guidelines. We could be a church that listens, embraces, and partners with our neighbors for the sake of God's mission. In particular, we could be a church that listens. Listens for the gifts and the hopes and the yearnings and the pain of our neighbors. Now, soon after I got to Long Island, I was sitting in a senior staff meeting, and we were talking about communications in the diocese. And someone happened to notice that the title of our diocesan publication is The Dominion. And it comes after our dominion or our diocesan shield, which of course says here, I will set his dominion in the sea. Now the first time I looked at that quote, I thought, oh wow, that's got empire written all over it. But I said, okay, because it's God's dominion. And then in our meeting, we actually turned to Psalm 89 and read together verses 21 to 26. If you'll read this with me, We'll do it antiphonally. <laughs> Maybe down the middle, that side doing the odd, this side doing the evens. That dominion is not God's. It is the dominion of the king, a man supposedly ordained by God to exercise power, which means that our diocesan motto, our diocesan shield, is a shining expression of the establishment empire imperative. And it is every bit a part of our continuing identity as a diocese. Maybe it's a part of yours, too. So we made some time together in our clergy conference for discernment and conversation. We told the body of more than 200 clergy that we needed a new name for the newsletter, but more than that, that we needed to revisit our relationship to empire. The title that came forth from those small group conversations, the one that stuck, was not the dominion, but soundings. I love this because it's still nautical. Of course, we are an island. <laughs> so it still conjures waters. Generally, soundings refer to the ancient practice of determining the depth of water, making a sounding, by feeding out a line with a weight at the end of it. You do soundings when you're in unfamiliar territory to figure out what are the deeps. You do soundings when you are out of your depth, no longer in control. You do soundings because it's time for you to do some listening, some deep listening. That's the practice that missionaries around the globe take up now. They learn the language of the people, the culture, the words, the foods, the icons. They do soundings. A missional church does soundings. It practices the fine art of listening in its local area, doing one-to-ones like classic community organizers in order to find out the yearnings, the gifts, the power, the hopes, the pain of the communities within which we are called to embody the gospel. We are listening, we are doing soundings, so that we can hear what God might have already been up to, and so that we can come alongside that activity in order to grow the kingdom life in that place. That's listening. And we could move through that listening into embrace, becoming churches that embrace and transform our communities, even as 
We are embraced and transformed by our neighbors and emerging cultures. The truth is, and we know this, that we do bring gifts with us, many gifts, as we enter mission and relationship in our context. Of course we do. We're not 100% empty-handed. We've got the baby. We've got those unique and beloved essentials of the Anglican way of embodying the love of God and discerning the mind of Christ. If you drop those essentials, then you may as well just go home. The question is, how much stuff are we carrying? In general, the established church of the Episcocrats comes complete with a trunk full of customs, books, rubrics, vestments, cultural moorings. We plunk that trunk down in front of a new group and we say, this is so beautiful and so good and we're so happy to be able to share it with you. <laughs> There's no opportunity in that exchange, for an exchange. There's no opportunity to receive the culture of the other, and no room for them to add their own gifts, or maybe even to create a fresh expression that would be new to us, but no less Anglican. The irony, of course, is that without mutual embrace and contextualization, we cannot call ourselves Anglican. Without mutual embrace and contextualization, we cannot call ourselves Anglican. In the 39 Articles of Faith, an early statement of Anglican doctrine, the Church's leaders declared, it is a thing plainly repugnant to the Word of God and the custom of the primitive Church to have public prayer in the Church or to minister the sacraments in a tongue not understood by the people. That's some strong language, repugnant. I don't think they're using it by accident. The founders could not have been clearer about the priority of context and the need to translate the gospel and traditions into the language of the people. Of course English speakers shouldn't be forced to pray in Latin or to try to relate to a God who couldn't understand their voices then why are so many 19th century English hymns ringing out of churches when the cries on the street are in Dominican Spanish? This is not an argument for mimicking culture. The gospel, I know, does not just affirm, comfort, and entertain people. It engages lives on the ground in order to transform us all so that we move deeper into the heart of God and closer to the likeness of Christ. But we are unlikely to receive or be changed by what we cannot understand. And so the question comes back to us, the ones who are sitting in some place of being able to shape the Episcopal life. Can you grow your tolerance for a messy church? A tacky church? We might not just have to sing gospel music, we may have to sing it badly. <laughs> you might have to grit our teeth through some spontaneous prayers and trust that God is somewhere in the ramblings of a homeless man. We might have to love the baby but introduce her to new waters and new cultures, cultures that are not rooted in a book cultures with more outbursts, more color, less adherence to form, less colonial power. We might have to release some of our hold on Mother England in order to embrace Mother Africa, Mother Italy, Mother Mexico. In the process, we might just end up becoming partners. Partners with our neighbors, and together creating something amazing for God. The point of all of this listening, this mutual embrace and transformation is not simply to look diverse or to get more of them inside. We go out to meet the other, to share and receive good news, so that we might all journey somewhere together with God. God wants this variety of gifts. God wants all of these voices. 
The record of Scripture makes plain just how much God longs for reconciliation. Jesus himself held out his hand and invited us by the power of the Spirit to embody reconciliation, to be ambassadors as a church, and then to enact that spirit of reconciliation in our wider communities. St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Duluth, Minnesota, took up that invitation. They were what they even called themselves, the Fortress Church. They had no relationship with their neighbors, this Fortress Church, except that some of the neighbors might have been servants for the members of the church. Seriously. They did a capital campaign, raised a million dollars, and they tied 100,000 of that to social ministry. But then they got radical. They didn't just set up a check-writing outreach committee. No. They built relationships with their neighbors. And then they welcomed those neighbors to be partners in creating a whole new neighborhood community organization. And together, the folks, the leaders in that organization decided what to do with the $100,000, what to do for God. So one day, after they created this organization and had been doing amazing things in their community together, one day, a member saw some kids from the neighborhood just outside the church. He didn't recognize them as members who had been in the church on a Sunday. But when one of the kids tried to spray graffiti on the church, another kid stopped him and said, you can't do that. That's my church. The neighborhood, these kids, had made a claim on that church. And they could do that because together they had been discerning and enacting the mission of God in that place. So bring in the outcasts and the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the Gentiles and the dogs who eat the scraps. Bring them all in with the Episcopats so that we can become one powerful, beautiful, and likely body of disciples. We could do something extraordinary together for God. <laughs> Amen. 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 Sing it, people. Amen. Sing it louder. Amen. Sing to God. Amen. 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 One more time now. Amen. 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 Have a seat. We're so close to done. I close this evening with nothing but hope because, as I said when I got started, the movement is already happening. You know, in one week in January, just last month, I had the chance to sit with the planning group for the Episcopal House of Bishops. Two days later, I sat with about 400 folks involved in Emergence Christianity, a gathering in Memphis. Would you believe that they were having the same conversation? Both were aware of the death of the established church, the death of the church's privileged way of life. Both were looking to resurrection life after death, and both knew that the resurrection body will not be the same as the one we knew before. Together, we are all, from the bishops to the emergents and everybody in between, we are all listening and embracing and partnering and ultimately discerning what is this, this resurrection, resurrection body, this resurrected church, going to be like? Well, this is what I know. We will not become that church if we are trapped in an either-or paradigm, defending the baby by preserving the bathwater. There has to be life beyond that whole win-loss scenario, the one that says you must either love freedom and chaos or love structure and rigidity, that you must love what's fresh or love tradition. 
or that you must love the gifts of your marginalized culture or accept the dominant upper-class Anglo-American culture. That path, that either-or path, is in no way missional. For the record, it is also in no way Anglican. Every Episcopalian, every Christian community must ultimately effect the balancing act between too much stiffness and too much variation. Because clinging to tradition and order because they are part of our identity, because we feel safe inside that structure, because we respect our ancestors, those are not reasons to block change. At the same time, freedom for its own sake, chaos just to watch the sparks fly, bowing at the altar of contemporary culture, these are not values in their own right. The only goal that matters is moving deeper into the heart of God, further along the path of Jesus, and out into loving solidarity with our communities. Whatever contributes to the flourishing of creation and the proclamation of the gospel, whatever increases Christ's peace and reconciliation, whatever makes the world shine with his light and love, that's what the baby needs. Let that water flow. Amen. Amen. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Thank you.